the trial chamber found that the crime of persecution consists of an act or an omission which discriminates in fact and denies or infringes upon a fundamental right laid down in international customary or treaty law and uh, was carried out deliberately with the intent to discriminate on one of the listed grounds, specifically race, religion, or politics. The trial chamber has understood race to include ethnicity. The trial chamber found that the campaign of persecutions against Bosnian Muslims and Bosnian Croats included killings, torture, physical violence, rapes and sexual assaults, constant humiliation and degradation, destruction and appropriation of non-Serb property, destruction of institutions dedicated to religion, deportation and forcible transfer, and the denial of fundamental rights, namely the denial of the fundamental rights to employment and freedom of movement, and the rights to proper medical care and proper judicial process. The trial chamber is further satisfied that the acts were discriminatory in fact and were committed by the perpetrators with the requisite discriminatory intent on racial, religious and political grounds. I now come to the criminal responsibility of the accused. I shall now turn to the question as to whether the accused, Radoslav Berjan, is criminally responsible for any of the crimes charged in the indictment under any of the modes of liability included therein. For this purpose, it is necessary to state some of the core issues examined by the trial chamber uh, in its uh, written judgment in order to establish the accused criminal responsibility. The trial chamber is satisfied beyond reasonable doubt that both prior to and during the period covered in the indictment, Radoslav Berjanin was a leading political figure in the autonomous region of Kraina, and that he held key positions at the <coughs> municipal, regional, and republic levels, including that of first vice president of the ARC Assembly, president of the ARC crisis staff, and later act acting deputy prime minister for production, Minister for Construction, Traffic and Utilities, and Acting Vice President of the Government of Republika Srpska. The trial chamber is satisfied that between mid-1991 and the end of 1992, the accused possessed de jure and de facto powers that made him one of the most significant and powerful political figures in the autonomous region of Kraina. The sources of his powers were twofold. In the first place, the accused possessed power by virtue of the political positions that he occupied at the municipal, regional and republic levels. In the second place, he was entrusted with political power directly by the Bosnian Serb leadership, including Radovan Karadzic himself. The trial chamber is further satisfied that the accused espoused the strategic plan and knew that it could only be implemented by the use of force and fear. Amongst the political figures in the Bosnia Kraina, it was the accused who was identified by the Bosnian Serb leadership as best representing the interests of the Serbian People Republic of Bosnia and Herzegovina. He was chosen to play a leading role in coordinating the implementation of the strategic plan in the autonomous region of Kraina. For this purpose, the top leadership of the Serbian Republic of Bosnia and Herzegovina granted the accused a high degree of authority and autonomy in areas of fundamental political importance, which is indicative of the trust the accused enjoyed at the highest political level. In a telephone conversation of, on the October 31st, 1991, Radovan Karadzic himself assured the accused that he had all the power in the Bosnian Kraina 
and indicated that he should take more decisions without consulting the party leadership. Moreover, in a conversation between Radozov, Radovan Karadzic and a certain Mirodlov on January 7, 1992, the accused was identified as a mature and politically strong personality who would be able to take power. Radoslav Berjanin made a substantial contribution to the implementation of the strategic plan in three distinct phases. Before the establishment of the ARC crisis staff in his capacity as member of the Assembly of the Serbian people in Bosnia and Herzegovina first and in the ARC assembly, as president of the ARC crisis staff and after the ARC crisis staff ceased to exist in his capacity as minister in the Republika Srpska government. Before the creation of the ARC crisis staff, Radovan Karadzic was already discussing and relying upon the accused amongst others to set up civilian commands to ensure territorial defense and civilian protection, to liaise with military officers and prepare for the mobilization of the Bosnian Serb military and to implement the policy of dismissing non-Serbs from their jobs. As president of the ARC crisis staff, the accused exercised de facto authority over the municipal authorities and the police and had substantial influence over the army and paramilitary groups. Through the decisions of the ARC crisis staff that can be attributed to him, the accused contributed to the implementations of the aims of the Bosnian Serb leadership in the autonomous region of Ukraine. After the ARC crisis staff was wound up, the accused not only maintained his political power in the Bosnian Ukraine, but also extended his power at the republic level. He continued to meet with high-ranking military and political officials and discuss issues concerning the implementation of the strategic plan. The trial chamber found that the accused made one of his most substantial contributions to the implementation of the strategic plan by means of a propaganda campaign against Bosnian Muslims and Bosnian Croats, which he conducted at different stages of his political career. His positions of authority gave him access to the media, which he used to make public statements, disseminating fear and hatred between Bosnian Serbs on one hand and Bosnian Muslims and Bosnian Croats on the other. Not only did the accused call for the dismissal of non-Serbs from their jobs, but he also publicly advocated that the non-Serb population should leave the Bosnian Ukraine. Moreover, the accused spoke openly against mixed marriages and publicly suggested a campaign of retaliatory ethnicity-based murder. The trial chamber is satisfied beyond reasonable doubt that although the accused's public statements may have been motivated in part by his drive towards self-advancement, they were intentional and had a disastrous impact on people of all ethnicities. They incited Bosnian Serbs to commit crimes and contributed to creating a climate where people were prepared to tolerate the commission of crimes as well as to commit crimes and where well-meaning Bosnian Serbs felt dissuaded and discouraged from extending any kind of assistance to non-Serbs. The non-Serb population of the Bosnia Ukraina understood the accused public statements as direct threats to leave the area under Bosnian Serb occupation and many of them did so in fear for their lives. A number of witnesses gave evidence that the accused's public statements constituted the main reason why they left the area. 
The trial chamber is additionally satisfied that the accused had detailed knowledge that during the time and in the area relevant to the indictment, crimes were being committed in the execution or the implementation of the strategic plan. In relation to each mode of liability presented in the indictment, I shall now proceed to underline the following general findings of the trial chamber. In order to hold the accused criminally responsible under the Institute of Joint Criminal Enterprise, the prosecution needs to establish a common plan amounting to and involving an agreement between the accused and the physical perpetrators of the crimes uh, in question uh, to commit a crime envisaged in the statute. The physical perpetrators uh, of the crimes in question are members of the police, the army, and paramilitary organizations. As the prosecution did not plead a joint criminal enterprise between the accused and the police, the trial chamber examined whether there was a joint criminal enterprise between the accused and members of the army and paramilitary organizations. In so doing, the trial chamber made reference to the strategic plan. As already stated, the trial chamber has found that the accused espoused this strategic plan. Moreover, it is satisfied that many of the relevant physical perpetrators of the crimes in question equally did so and acted towards its, its implementation. However, the trial chamber is of the view that the mere espousal of the strategic plan by the accused on one hand and many of the relevant physical perpetrators on the other hand is not equivalent to an arrangement between them to commit a concrete crime. Indeed, the accused and the relevant physical perpetrators could espouse the strategic plan and form a criminal intent to commit crimes with the aim of implementing the strategic plan independently from each other and without having an understanding or entering into any agreement between them to commit a crime. The trial chamber further examined whether an understanding or agreement to that effect between the accused and the relevant physical perpetrators could be inferred from the fact that they acted in unison to implement the strategic plan. Given the physical and structural remoteness between the accused and the relevant physical perpetrators and the fact that the relevant physical perpetrators in most of these cases have not even been personally identified, the trial chamber is not satisfied that the only reasonable conclusion that may be drawn from the accused and the relevant physical perpetrators concerted action aimed towards the implementation of this strategic plan is that the accused entered into an agreement with the relevant physical perpetrators to commit a crime. Indeed, the trial chamber is satisfied that the evidence allows for other reasonable inferences to be drawn. The trial chamber is of the view that joint criminal enterprise is not an appropriate mode of liability to describe the individual criminal responsibility of the accused, given the extraordinary broad nature of this case, where the prosecution seeks, seeks to include within a joint criminal enterprise a person who is considered to be remote from the commission of the crimes charged in the indictment as the accused. The trial chamber therefore dismissed joint criminal enterprise as a mode of liability in this case. Planning is also dismissed as a mode of liability under Article 7.1 of the statute, as the trial chamber found that taking into consideration the individual responsibility of the accused that has been established and to which I will come soon, there is insufficient evidence to conclude that the accused was involved in the immediate preparation of the concrete crimes. Regarding criminal responsibility under Article 7.3 of the statute, the trial chamber found 
that although the ARC crisis staff had de facto authority over the municipal authorities and the police and influence over the army and paramilitary organizations, the accused as president of the ARC crisis staff or in any of his other positions between April and the end of December 1992, did not have effective control over members of the municipal authorities, the police, the army or paramilitary organizations, which would entail his material ability to prevent or punish the commission of crimes by these individuals. Thus, the trial chamber dismisses superior criminal responsibility under Article 7.3 of the statute as a possible mode of liability. The remaining modes of liability under Article 7.1 of the statute were examined successively for each of the crimes charged in the indictment, and the trial chamber reached the following conclusions. Regarding willful killings. Regarding willful killings, the trial chamber is satisfied that the ARC crisis of decisions on disarmament between May 9th and 18th, 1992, constituted practical assistance to the attacks of the Bosnian Serb forces on non-Serb towns, villages and areas, and that these decisions were attributable to the accused. <coughs> The trial chamber is further satisfied that the accused was aware that during these armed attacks, the Bosnian Serb forces would commit a number of crimes, including the crime of willful killing of a number of non-Serbs, non and that the members of the Bosnian Serb forces carrying out the killings in question had the required intent to kill. Throughout the ARC crisis staff decisions, uh, through the ARC crisis of decisions on disarmament, the accused had a substantial effect on the commission of these killings. The trial chamber is satisfied that the accused aided and abetted in the killings committed by the Bosnian Serb forces in the context of the armed attacks of the Bosnian Serb forces on Serb, non-Serb towns, villages and areas after May 9, 1992. The trial chamber is not satisfied that it has been sufficiently proved that the same ARC crisis staff decisions or any of the acts of the accused render him criminally responsible for other killings mentioned in the indictment. The trial chamber is not satisfied that the evidence establishes beyond reasonable doubt that the accused was aware that by issuing our crisis staff decisions on disarmament, he would be assisting in the killings on a massive scale such as to amount to the crime of extermination. Nor has it been established beyond reasonable doubt that the accused knew that the members of the Bosnian Serb forces intended to commit killings on a massive scale such as to amount to the crime of extermination. Applying the same reasoning for the acts of torture charged in the indictment as for the acts of willful killing, the trial chamber found that the accused aided and abetted the torture committed by Bosnian Serb forces in the context of the armed attacks of the Bosnian Serb forces on non-Serb towns, villages and areas after May 9th. The date when the R 1992, the date when the ARC crisis staff issued its first decision on disarmament. In addition, however, the trial chamber is satisfied also that the accused aided and abetted the commission of the underlying acts of torture in camps and other detention facilities throughout the autonomous region of Kraina by Bosnian Serb forces. It has been established beyond reasonable doubt that with the exception of the Yasenitsa and Petar Kocic elementary schools, all the camps and detention facilities mentioned in the evidence came into being once the ARC crisis had been established. There is ample evidence that the establishment of these camps and detention facilities formed an integral part of the strategic plan, that the accused was aware, fully aware, of the nature of these camps and detention facilities, and that detainees were tortured therein. During his mandate as president of the ARC crisis staff, 
Not only did the accused not take a stand in public or during art crisis staff meetings against them, but he adopted a laissez-faire attitude and spoke in public about them in a way which sent the wrong message to those who were committing crimes inside these camps and detention facilities. Therefore, the trial chamber is satisfied that his inactivity as well as his public attitude with respect to the camps and detention facilities constituted moral encouragement and support to the members of the Bosnian Serb army and police to continue running these camps and detention facilities in the way described to the trial chamber throughout the trial. Turning to the crimes of deportation and forcible transfer, the trial chamber is satisfied that the ARC crisis staff decisions of May 28 and 29, 1992, advocating the resettlement of the non-Serb population, prompted the municipal authorities and the police who implemented them to commit the crimes of deportation and forcible transfer. The trial chamber is also of the view that the only reasonable conclusion that may be drawn when the terms of these conditions are considered in the light of the accused unambiguous statement made repeatedly from early April 1992 onwards calling upon the non-Serb population to leave the Bosnian Kraina and stating that only a small percentage of non-Serbs would be allowed to state is the only reasonable conclusion is that the decisions could only have been meant as a direct incitement to deport or forcibly transfer non-Serbs from the territory of the autonomous region of Ukraine. The trial chamber is satisfied that with the exception of the failed attempts at displacing the Bosnian Muslim population of Gornia Agici and Donia Agici and Chirna Rijeka in Boranski Novi on May 24, 1992, the deportations to Karlovac and the forcible transfers to Travnik originating in the autonomous region of Ukraine and described in great detail in the judgment, all took place after the adoption of the ARC crisis staff decisions previously mentioned. Furthermore, the accused espousal of the strategic plan of which the crimes of deportation and forcible transfer formed an integral part and the implementation of which he coordinated in his position as president of the ARC crisis staff, demonstrated that he intended to induce the commission of the crimes of deportation and forcible transfer. On that basis, the trial chamber found that the accused instigated these forcible transfers and deportation. In addition, the trial chamber is also satisfied that the accused aided and abetted the execution of these crimes through his inflammatory and discriminatory public statements. He instigated uh, them also through the decisions on disarmament uh, of the ARC crisis staff mentioned previously, and finally through the ARC crisis staff decision of June 12, 1992, which set up the agency for the movement of people and exchange in Banja Luka. The trial chamber reiterates the reasoning used for the crime of willful killing, for the crime of destruction, namely that the ARC crisis staff decisions on disarmament constituted practical assistance uh, to the attacks of the Bosnian Serb forces on non-Serb towns, villages and areas, and that the accused was aware that crimes, including the crime of wanton destruction of cities, towns and villages or devastation, not justified by military necessity, would be committed. The trial chamber is thus satisfied that the accused aided and abetted in the wanton destruction of cities, towns and villages or devastation not justified by military necessity committed by the Bosnian Serb forces on non-Serb towns, villages and areas in Bozanski Novi, Bozanski Petrovac, Celinac, Doni Vakuf, Kluc, Kotorvaros, Priedor, Sanski Most, Shipovo, and Teslic after May 9, 1992. With the same reasoning and having examined the evidence carefully, 
the trial chamber is satisfied that the accused aided and abetted the destruction or willful damage done to institutions dedicated to religion committed by the Bosnian Serb forces in the context of the armed attacks of the same forces on non-Serb towns, villages and areas in Bosanski Novi, Bosanski Petrovac, Celinac, Doni Vakuf, Kluč, Kotorvaros, Priedor, Prinjavor, Sanski Most, Šipovo and Teslic after May 9, 1992. Finally, regarding the crime of persecution, the trial chamber has previously established the responsibility of the accused for aiding and abetting certain crimes of willful killings, torture, destruction and devastation of cities, towns, villages and instituted institutions dedicated to religion, as well as deportation and forcible transfer. The accused has also been found guilty for instigating certain incidents of deportation and forcible transfer. The trial chamber is further satisfied that the accused aided and abetted persecution with respect to physical violence, rapes, sexual assaults, constant humiliation and degradation, as well as appropriation of property. Furthermore, the trial chamber is satisfied that the accused ordered the denial of the fundamental right to employment of Bosnian Muslims and Bosnian Croats in the municipalities mentioned above through a decision of the ARC crisis staff of June 22nd, 1992, providing for the dismissal of virtually all non-Serbs in the autonomous region of Kraina an act which amounts to persecution. Moreover, the conclusion of the trial chamber is that the accused aided and abetted persecution with respect to the denial of the right to freedom of movement and the right to proper judicial process of the mentioned ethnic groups. However, the trial chamber found that the evidence before it is insufficient to establish the responsibility of the accused for the denial of the right to proper medical care. In relation to all these underlying acts, the trial chamber is satisfied that not only the physical perpetrators, but also the accused possessed the intent to discriminate against the Bosnian Muslim and Bosnian Croat victims. Sentencing. The trial chamber assessed the factors which it considered relevant to an appraisal, a proper appraisal of the gravity of the crimes of which the accused has been found guilty and his responsibility. The prosecution in this case, considering the gravity of the crimes charged in the indictment, the aggravating factors submitted, and the alleged absence of any significant mitigating factor, claimed that the criminal responsibility of the accused could only be adequately addressed and punished with a sentence of life imprisonment. The defense put forward a preliminary objection to the absence from the proceedings of a separate and ad hoc sentencing hearing after conviction and submitted that because of this, he could not make adequate submissions on sentencing. The trial chamber does not agree with this submission, and the reasons are given in detail in the judgment. The defense, however, must be noted, did make several submissions for the purpose of sentencing, and these are dealt with comprehensively in the judgment, and I will be uh, referring to some of them later on. The trial chamber found that the following were relevant aggravating circumstances to which appropriate weight, as indicated in the judgment, was attached when determining the sentence. The position of leadership of the accused, the status 
and vulnerability of the victims and the impact of the crimes on the victims, the willingness of the accused's participation, the duration of the criminal conduct, and to a lesser extent, as explained in the written judgment, the educational background of the accused. However, the trial chamber found that the following were relevant mitigating uh, circumstances to which the appropriate weight indicated in the written judgment was attached when determining the sentence. Some carried significant mitigatory importance, some much less so. These were contributing to the decision to provide shelter to Bosnian Muslims from Celinac, treating all citizens equally in certain instances, voicing concern about some paramilitaries, participating in the decision to arrest members of the Mitya group, the family status and age of the accused, his few speeches against profiteering from the armed conflict, his respectful conduct during the course of these proceedings, and his conduct with witnesses uh, testifying against him, particular one in particular, and finally his remorse in uh, some individualized instances. Finally, in accordance with the statute and the rules, the trial chamber took into consideration the general sentencing practice of the courts of the former Yugoslavia, acknowledging that it was not bound by this practice. The trial chamber noted that under the criminal code of the Socialist Federal Republic of Yugoslavia, the range of penalties existing in 1992 started with a fine continued with confiscation of property, imprisonment, and capital punishment. The maximum term of imprisonment was 15 years, except for offenses punishable with the death penalty, committed under a particularly aggravating circumstances or causing especially grave consequences, in which case the maximum term of imprisonment was of 20 years. The trial chamber, pursuant to Rule 87C, decided to impose a single sentence in this case, as it reflects better the criminal conduct of the accused, which denotes a constant pattern of criminal behavior occurring within a closed temporal context. And we finally come to the disposition. Radoslav Berjanin, please rise. For the reasons I summarized above, this trial chamber, having heard all the evidence presented by the prosecution and the defense, finds you not guilty of count one, genocide, count two, complicity in genocide, count four, extermination as a crime against humanity, and count ten, extensive destruction and appropriation of property not justified by military necessity and carried out unlawfully and wantonly as a grave breach of the 1949 Geneva Conventions. The, pursuant to Article 7.1 of the statute, the trial chamber finds you guilty of count three, persecution as a crime against humanity incorporating count six, torture, count eight, deportation, and count nine, forcing, forcible transfer as an inhumane act. Count five, willful killing as a grave breach of the 1949 Geneva Conventions. Count seven, torture as a grave breach of the 1949 Geneva Conventions. Count 11, wanton destruction of cities, towns and villages, or devastation not justified by military necessity as a violation of the laws and customs of war. And finally, count 12, 
destruction or willful damage done to institutions dedicated to religion as a violation of the laws and customs of war. We sentence you, Radoslav Berjanin, to a single sentence of 32 years of imprisonment and state that you are entitled to credit for five years, one month, and 26 days as of the date of this judgment, calculated from the date of your deprivation of liberty, that is, the 6th of July, 1999, together with such additional time as you may serve pending the determination of any appeal. Finally, pursuant to Rule 103 of the Rules, you shall remain in the custody of the Tribunal pending the finalization of arrangements for your transfer to the State where this sentence will be served. The Court stands adjourned. All rise.